I'm still in my series. Question is, is anybody still with me on the tape ministry and otherwise? I left off my last message. I ran out a little bit of time, and I probably didn't expound on as much as would have been good in the way of illustration. But remember I told you about the old cowboy. We're standing there at the fireplace. The wife is upset. The mother is shooting daggers and verbal abuse at me. The girlfriends that are with her, they're putting in their two cents. It was chaos right there. But I had to tell you, I was holding my ground. And he said, hold it. Hold it just a so-and-so minute here. And he said, this is a fine time to bring this up. And there was one part I forgot to tell you that my son reminded me. He says, if you're not going to obey me, there's no sense going through with this marriage. And uh, there's a lot of truth there. Well, the rest of that story has to do that I saw that old cowboy sometime later. Now, during that argument that was going on there in front of the fireplace, the sire and the dam of the bride, her original mother and father, who were friends with each other, had been married and divorced several times themselves, they were giving her away. They were quite upset with me. The old cowboy said to me later, he says, you know, sometime after that, my son-in-law, or excuse me, he said my brother-in-law, my wife's, it would be his wife's brother, uh, he's a veterinarian. He has a small animal practice down in such and such area. And uh, he's always been wanting to get into large animal practice. And a good friend of his was working with a partner up in the mountains, a very beautiful mountain community over on the western slope. And uh, his partner retired, so his friend called up and said, look, you can come in as partner in this large animal practice. and We'll build it up together. And when his wife came home, or he came home, one or the other, he was very excited. He said, guess what? We're moving to such and such place, Colorado, not far from the Montrose area, so you know how pretty that is. And uh, she said, no, we're not. What do you mean? I have my job, I have my career, I have my friends. Anyway, they didn't move. And uh, now the sire and dam of the bride, the mother and father, see how miserable their son is. And the old cowboy told me later, he said that his father-in-law told him, you know, I think maybe that old preacher knew what he was talking about. Because, and then explain how Junior was so miserable and unhappy. I told that story at my church, and as I said, a lady came up to me and explained what had happened in her marriage. Her husband's gone now, deceased. But she said she put her foot down that they were not moving. Why did she do that? Because she thought it was best for the family. Uh, she had her job and so forth. Women do it because they think it's best because they really think or feel, I should say, that they know better than God. Well, in that case, it was sad because I knew that her marriage had ended in such a way that in one room she slept in the other, they went their separate ways, and she reflected back that it went back to that time that she put her foot down and did what she thought was best for the family. Turn over there to 1 Peter. We'll be looking at some review in this message. That's why I start off by reviewing that story. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, we read this in the last message. It says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And let not your dormant be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses. But let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Can you not see Abraham and his household? They'd lived a long time, and they were pretty well established in the Ur of Chaldea area. Is that not where he came from? And rest assured that Sarah had her friends there. 
and her family. And God said one day, Abraham, I want you to pack your bags. I want you to leave here. I want you to go to an area where you don't have family, nor do you have an occupation, nor is it your country, nor is it your people. I want you to go. Now, when he came home and told Sarah, guess what? We're going. What do you think she said? Sure. Whatever you say, Lord. We know in our minds that that's exactly the way it was. Had he not had his house in order, we would not have our faithful father Abraham to claim as our father of the faithful. Aren't you glad that his house was in order? But if it was a woman of today that he was speaking to, you would hear things, what do you mean? Are you crazy, you bozo? You don't have a job? You don't, we don't know anybody there? Why would you be going? I'm not going to, you're not going to get me to go out there in the wilderness and leave my family. I've got my sisters and, 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 and her kids and, and my wife and my mother. And can you not hear all the things that they could come up with? Now, if you want to go, you go right on ahead, but I'm staying right here. And if Abraham had been like the women whipped men, wimps that we have today, he would have never gone. And we wouldn't have our heritage today. Something to think about, isn't it? Something to think about. My son and my daughter one time, I sent them to a Dale Carnegie course. And my son was telling me that there was a visitor there at that course from, I think it was Ireland. And she got up to speak. Maybe she was actually taking the course. Don't remember exactly. And she started talking about her husband. But, you know, she didn't use the term husband. She used the term lordship, his lordship. And guess what all the other ladies in the class, the American ladies, did? They laughed at her. Out loud, they laughed at her. I've heard women who have had First Peter read there and go home and say, oh, I suppose you want me to call you your lordship. Ha, 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 ha. I'm dealing with a spirit that prevails in our land. And I'm dealing with it such a way that it might not bring me popularity, but it's going to move her one way or the other. And don't tell me what we've got to do to get this country back. I know. I figured it out. You start right there in a the house and you put the house in order. And there's a lot of ladies saying, why don't you men be men and go out and do something? But they don't want you to be the man at the house. They'll take care of that. No, we'll take care of that and then we'll go on. The kingdom is ours for the taking, like the first previous speaker said. If we've got enough nerve to take it there. But the Baal priests don't say that. Now, the Baal priests are the religious leaders for the system on the left. God has men still that will represent the right. We call them prophets or, or priests, Melchizedek priests and so forth. Think of them as men who are willing to speak the truth. Baal priests, however, are threatened by the true prophet. I'm not talking about a man that has visions necessarily today. I'm talking about a man that's willing to stand up and preach the truth. They are threatened. You see... One system is antagonistic to the other. I explained to you earlier about it doesn't look like we're going to be able to have another camp at Camp Cedar Edge in the Rocky Mountains. Reason why? Because the Ministerial Alliance have gotten together and had petitions and raised a furor in the community. It's head up by a Methodist minister up there in the Cedar Edge area, so I've been informed. And it looks like the uh, camp management's going to give in to them. <coughs> And when I talked to the uh, business manager, I said, yeah, I says, if, if it had been a bunch of homosexuals assembling on the grounds, I said, those Ministerial Alliance boys wouldn't even have minded, would they? He said, no, he said, they would have come out and ordained you. Well, I don't take offense, personally, because I understand. It's war. It's either them or us. Their system or ours. The problem is they know it's war, the, the enemies of the left quite often, but we don't. Well, I do. I know it's war. 
And don't think there isn't going to be a little war going on in some homes where these tapes messages are played. You know, just suit yourself. Who's going to rule? And that's what it boils down to. Baal priests cannot preach the truth because they depend upon the masses for their support. They appeal to their God with petitions for funds. Their God is the Baal system, a socialistic mentality, the people. That's why they're always making petitions for funds. And they have to serve their God. Their God says, if you want our blessings, you give us what we want. And it's certainly not the truth. Whereas the true prophet, he is there to try to change the popular mindset. He tries to change it and bring it captive to God's word, the mind of Christ, if you will. And he's always in comparison of voice crying out in the wilderness. You ever wonder why? People say, well, you know, you really need to be on some television stations. Uh, and you need more radio stations. Well, I can't argue that. Why do you suppose I'm not? Well, it goes down to funds, you see. You see, it's a voice crying in the wilderness because the only ones that appreciate the truth are the remnant. And if you only have a remnant versus the masses, you see, he will always be the voice crying in the wilderness. And a ra I was talking to Pastor Wyland coming out here about radio stations. A radio station for a Baal priest returns profit. You know, when I put on a radio station, I do not receive back what it costs. So how can you put on a radio station? Because the remnant supports the radio station. Does that make sense? And the remnant appreciate the truth, and the only way they'll support the radio station is if you preach the truth. And in the long run, it ends up paying, like we talked about that young couple that was here. She was a woman liber at one time, a now organization member, and they had the little children. They're doing homeschooling. You see, it begins to build and build and build, and they know how it works. And so the Baal priests are continually threatened by the true priests, men and women like yourself. Does that make sense? And the Baal priest, his main job is to preach the party line. What I mean by that is he has to keep in power those that are in power. For example, Mr. Hoskins spoke earlier about how the churches in the 60s prior to the civil rights law, they did not believe in what? Integration. But all of a sudden when the civil rights law is passed, all of a sudden the ministers realized that they were wrong. And that integration is part of God's plan. What's their job? Wet the finger, stick it up, see which way the wind's blowing, and figure out which what they're supposed to preach. Because they keep the power in power. Let's have some review. I'm going to slow it down a little bit because I know I've been hammering pretty hard here. Let's go to Ephesians 5, verse 22. Now, I want you to pay close attention to what I'm going to read because I'm going to show you in this message how the Baal priests teach exactly the opposite. You see, the mother and the bride of that story I told you, they wanted me to rewrite the vows. They wanted me to ignore the spirit as well as the letter of, of the law concerning husband and wife, did they not? And they really thought they were going to do that. As Ted was saying, he was laughing about it in the room here at camp. He said, you know, that mother didn't know who she was tangling with. <laughs> and not that I'm some great individual. It's just the fact that she figured I was just another minister. You know, we're going to pay you, change the vows the way we tell you. Well, there was no changes. Well, they want it rewritten, and so the Baal priest will rewrite in the minds of Christians the very scriptures I'm going to read here in Ephesians 5. Verse 22, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the, Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, 
he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Let's look at verse 24 again. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Let's drop on down to verse 33. Nevertheless, let each individual among you love your own wives, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her <coughs> husband. Now, there'll be many women that will have their Bibles open, and they will note that I read verse 22, 23, and 24, but I didn't read verse 25 through 32. And their response will be this. Well, why don't you go ahead and read what the Bible says the husband is supposed to do to the wife about loving the wife. Why do you stop right there? You suppose anybody's thinking that? And here's the answer. Because it is completely irrelevant. How do you say that word? I, I have a hard time with that word. That means it doesn't make any difference. It is completely irrelevant. The Obedience of the wife is not conditioned upon the husband loving and treating her as he should. And since I'm putting the house in order, I'm starting right where God started. He didn't start with the husband loving the wife first and then saying the wife being in submission. He starts right in this passage with the wife being in submission to the husband. So let's go in the order that God has lined it out. You know, there is a mentality today that obedience by the wife is conditioned upon the way he treats her. Isn't that right? And that it's conditioned upon what his decisions are, if they're right or wrong. And guess who's deciding that? It's conditioned upon you love me and bless me and then I'll obey you. But that's not the way it works. The way it works is you obey, and as I said, do it. You obey first. The love and the blessings come later. These two systems that we have are just opposite of each other. And we are experiencing a feminine mentality in our society today that, well, if he did love and obey, love and cherish, there wouldn't be any trouble with me obeying or with the wife of our land obeying, the wives of our land obeying. And that is not true. But I wanted to really drive it home and want you to understand, just like the lady that wrote the book that I read in the last message on me obey him, she said, ladies, let's be intellectually honest. There is no condition here. And let's also be honest. If the husband was the most loving, perfect individual in the world, the wife would still have a problem obeying. Now let me show you why that is. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, after the fall in the garden, we read these words in verse 16. He says, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm relatively confident that what this means is this. I don't think he's saying that the curse you have is that you desire your husband physically. I personally think that the curse is you will desire him in such a way as you want to rule over him, yet he will rule over you. Now, Gother does a pretty good job of expounding on that, and I didn't remember how he did it. I didn't take down the notes at the time, but it, as I've since had that seminar about 15 years ago, I've observed and I've noticed that it, it is a universal problem. Amongst even the finest Christian women, there is this battle. They, they always have to battle. They, they have to catch themselves. I had one lady come up to me yesterday and said, you know, I've heard your messages here at camp, and I didn't think I needed to hear them until I heard them. 
You see, it's a battle, and sometimes they don't even realize it. But she automatically tends to want to get above the husband. Yet he shall rule over you. Now, the battle the man has is he has an automatic tendency to let her do it. You see, Eve was deceived. It was a different word there in Timothy, as I pointed out, concerning Eve versus Adam. Adam wasn't deceived when he ate. He gave in. So you see, not only did we have a woman that was the problem, we had a man, as the colonel pointed out last night, a weak-willed, wimpy man. And so God has put together this thesis and antithesis today, as I point out in my series of tapes on God's dialectics. The thesis and antithesis forming a synthesis where the two become one. But I figured out in a big hurry when I got married, all of a sudden we had one force meeting another. Wow! <laughs> Where's this stuff of living happily ever after? <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Every marriage knows what I'm talking about because that's the way God designed them. Man has a tendency to try to, in his dating system, he says, okay, uh, we'll take down the data here. Do you like pepperoni pizza? Okay. She likes pepperoni pizza. Oh, you guys are very compatible. That's man's system. But if you analyze God's system, when he set up this thing in marriage, he made opposites all the way. One strong, one softer. Uh, one arouses fast, one goes slow. One thinks more logically, one thinks emotionally. Every single item right down the line. Wham! You know? And... Uh, it was a good thing that there was some glue that came along right away in most marriages. It's, you know, in our case, uh, my wife started getting sick in the mornings uh, rather soon. And you see, if you analyze God's plan, then those children help hold that together. And it, it happens a lot, does it not? But then over a period of time, as the children grow, by the time they're leaving the nest, the two have become what? One. Well, the other thing I should cover here, and I'm going to cover more detail in the coming message in this series. I said we must have prayer. We must have forgiveness. I told the men, be patient. Here's a rule of thumb. I had a fellow up at camp who was all upset with some people that came to camp. We had people at camp that, from every stage of growth in Christ, and because they didn't see things like he saw it, he thought it was terrible. I said, hey, why don't you do this? Be as patient with other people as God has been with you. Amen? But we forget that rule of thumb. But there is another thing, too. We read in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, that he has promised us a helper. Sisters in Christ, I know you need help in this area, and brothers in Christ, I know you need help in this area. And that's why he's given us the Holy Spirit, our helper. And so, as you determined to bring your lives and your home in order with God's order, you must look very closely at Acts 2.38, baptism for the remission of sins, which we'll do in a coming message, so that you might receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. But I think I'll keep on in review on this one. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I read this yesterday today in the previous message, it says, we are destroying, in verse 5, in verse 5 it says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now I thought it was interesting, I had uh, this checked out, that word captive, taking every thought captive, as is given in this New American Standard translation, is the basic same Greek word as we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sin, led on by various impulses. Now I said they're the basic same Greek word. One is 162, the other one's 163 in Strong's. They come from a 164 number in Strong's, which means a prisoner of war. That is generally a captive. We are in warfare right now. And as I'm going to point out in another message, 
What do they take as the conquerors, the spoils of war over the conquered? Women and children. And the same thing has happened in our society. And as Isaiah said, women and children rule over them. Also, in way of review, when we read 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6, it talks about you wives in like manner be submissive. That means to place or to rank under, to obey. Remember that in way of review? And, of course, as I said, there'll be some that say rank under. You mean like a doormat. No, like a queen who is under the king. And you can't have a queen without a king. And if you want to be treated like a queen, treat him like a king. Not one of these kings that are there for parade and show, where you take him down to the church and parade him off and, and lie to yourself and everybody else lies to themselves that the elders are the head of their house. How many times have I seen elders, so-called church elders, they can get along just fine in a men's meeting and make decisions. They go home, what do you mean? Don't you, know what that, don't you know what that means? You go back there and you tell them this and that. You ever heard that? I know a group of men that were able to get together in a community situation and they could work everything out until the one fellow would go home and his wife would set him straight. And nine times out of ten, I'll guarantee you this, nine times out of ten, if there's a problem, particularly in a church gathering, guess who's at the bottom of it? Guess, let's be honest, a woman, women. Like one lady was telling me, her preacher years ago used to say that, how was it he'd rather preach to murderers and thieves and robbers than a bunch of long-tongued, gossipy women who refused to obey? Was it something along those lines? Bossy women, he said. Yeah, bossy women. Well... That preacher, he's long since gone, but uh, he knew what he was talking about. Sometimes it's easier to face those others. We pointed out in Luke 2.51 that that word subjection, where it says that Christ continued in subjection to his parents, is the same word that Peter used in a wife being in submission to her husband. And as we said, if you think about it, Christ was smarter. He was more spiritual even at that age. He was enjoying what he was doing. It gave him fulfillment. But his parents said, Jesus, come home. Right? And what did he do? He went home. It wasn't like the kids say, Oh, come on, Mom, come on, you know? You know, it wasn't like many wives today. Well, if you love me, you wouldn't be asking me to do this. You wouldn't be trying to take from me the thing that brings joy and fulfillment in my life. And uh, this is what I want to do. And I, this is what God's called me to do. I'm doing my father's business here. Couldn't he have gave those arguments? He just obeyed. Obeyed. Do it. A gentle and quiet spirit the woman is to have. This is still a way of review. And I know it has to be reviewed. That word for quiet is the same word that is used in 1 Timothy 2.2 2, where it says to pray to those who are over us so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life. And you know, that's really, if you think about it, that's really what a man wants. He wants peace in his home, doesn't he? And quite often, how many times over the years have I watched women do this? She uses that knowledge to manipulate him. It becomes a manipulative tool knowing full well that he wants peace, and as a result, she becomes contentious. She becomes contentious, naggy, unhappy. An unhappy wife is a way of giving public reproach to her husband. You ever think about that? And have you ever seen this used? Some fella says, well, I, I didn't do what my wife wanted me to do, and she's still upset. She won't forgive me. How come? Well, because that is a way of keeping you in line. She's going to let you remember this for a long time because just in case you might again decide to do something she doesn't want done, you'll remember this. 
You think I'm hitting them anywhere? It works that way. In the book, Me Obey Him, that I read yesterday, on page 64, she said this, quote, Men hate scenes. They despise confusion and disorder. They will go to almost any length to have peace in their homes. They will let a woman have her way rather than argue and quarrel. End quote. Let's stop there. Think that's a wise woman wrote, wrote that book? Let me see it again. It says, they will let a woman have her way rather than argue and quarrel. But let me read on. But the price a man has to pay is the price of his manhood. End quote. A wise woman wrote that book. You know, so very often I had a lady come up to me and she said, you know, my husband said to me one time, I am not going to let you blankety blank, basically castrate me, straight me like your sisters do their husbands. And she says, I didn't understand what he was talking about. And a lot of times that will happen. A woman doesn't know what a man's talking about. When he says, listen, I'm going to be a man either with or without you, but I'm going to be a man. What are you talking about? I'm not doing anything about your manhood. Yes. If the man gives in to the wife just to have peace and tranquility in the home, guess what's happening? Snip, 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 snip. He knows it. You know perfectly well, man, what happens in the end. Don't you? There's sometimes if you're going to take the house back, you have to say, I will be the man with or without you, but by God, I will be a man. Regardless of the cost. Amen? Men have paid a terrible price for their peace and tranquility. And ladies, this isn't my notes either, but I've seen this happen with women. They'll even use their physical body, withhold it or give it as reward and punishments to make this puppy dog jump through the hoops that she wants jumped through. <coughs> Isn't it true? And isn't it interesting? You don't find that written about by the Baal priest very often in the books. Now, let's go back to Ephesians 5, verse 33. Still in way of review. And by the way, let me say this. It's ungodly. It's on the border of witch... Well, it is witchcraft. And let's think about witches... It is better to obey than what? The sacrifice. And disobedience is like the sin of what? Witchcraft. And for women to use these tools to manipulate, I mean, it's wicked, is it not? Well, in verse 33 it says, And let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. Now, that's basically the same word that Peter uses when he talks about their respectful behavior. Phobia or phobos, it means to put the flight, fear, dread, terror. The Bible says, let the wife fear her husband. Let the wife be in dread of her husband. Let the wife recognize the terror of her husband. Isn't that what the word means, phobio? It's the same word. Get this. You might want to take notes on it. Now, I know. There'll be people here. this. They're going to be all bent out of shape. But don't get mad at me. I didn't write this Bible. I didn't. I wasn't the one that put that word phobio in the manuscript. <laughs> I'm just telling you what it says. And then Romans 13.3 says, Rulers are not a terror to good works, but evil. That's the same word, terror. Matthew 28.4 the guards shook for fear. That's when Christ resurrected. The same word, phobia. Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Acts 5.5, 5, great fear came on, on, on them all. 
2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Are we to know the phobia or the terror of our Lord? Are we not to fear God? Does not the scripture say the, first, the, the whole duty of man is what? To fear God and keep his commandments? You know, fear and keeping the commandments have something going hand in hand. Certainly, I, I keep commandments out of love, but let's just admit it. Sometimes we don't love the Lord like we ought to, but sometimes we know we can't go but too far because of our fear and dread of what would happen. Isn't that true? And 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, perfecting holiness in the fear or phobia of the Lord. That's the same word in Scripture for teaching that the woman is to fear her husband. How many Baal priests do you think would preach that on the radio? I think I might play this on the radio, by the way. Would you bring my briefcase up here? I have some books there. Speaking of Baal priests, as I said, the first day I arrived at this Christian campground, I stopped over there at the Christian bookstore they have, and I uh, saw some books on marriage, and there was three of them there on marriage, so I just went ahead and purchased all three of them. Figured to get a sermon illustration or two out of it, and I think I'm going to get a whole other sermon out of it. But uh, here are the three that I picked up. One's called Good Marriages Take Time by uh, David and Carol Hawking. This is Communication, Communication, Key to Your Marriage by H. Norman Wright. Here's one by a Kenneth Chafin called Is There a Family in the House? Now, time obviously doesn't allow me to go in great detail here, but I just read to you Ephesians 5, and I've expounded some on it. Let's look and see how the Baal priests handle that. Remember, the Baal priests are there to keep those in power in power, to preach the party line. They're there to rewrite the scriptures or to say what you want them to say. Now, this is what this man says. This is Norman Wright. He is, says in the back of the book he has taught at Biola University and is currently on the faculty of Talbot Theological Seminary. He is founder and director of the Christian Marriage Enrichment and Family Counseling and Enrichment in Santa Ana, California. He is a licensed marriage, family, and child counselor in the state of California. Norm has authored more than 40 books. When you read that he's a licensed counselor, that means he's working for who? The person that licensed him, which is the state, which is the bail that the Bible talks about. What are we talking about? Bail priests. The state doesn't allow you to spank your children anymore, right? What does the Bible talk about that? <laughs> Which side do you think he's on? At least he has his license jerked. And the same way would hold true in marriages. The state does not allow the husband to be the terror, the ruler <laughs> of the home. Well, page 20. First, he says, first, a wife's submission to her husband is from complete freedom and love, not from compulsion or fear. What did Ephesians say? He says, the church submits to the lordship of Christ on a voluntary basis in response to his love. Is that true? Turn over to uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 11, just to take time to look at that. God just had an event take place in the eye, before the eyes of the church there. Why? Look at verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Did God teach the children of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt to fear him? Did God teach the early church to fear him? Why? Because he likes to scare people? No, because he knows the duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. And keeping his commandments has something to do with fear. And don't think it's any different in the home. Amen? Let's read what he said again. First, a wife's submission to her husband is from complete freedom and love, not from compulsion or fear. The church submits to the lordship of Christ on a voluntary basis in response to his love. 
And I just read to you how they responded to his fear that he instilled upon them. The terror of the Lord. I ought to look at, oh, it's the same word, phobio. Same word. Let the wife see to it that she phobio her husband. And what's this Baal priest saying? Here's another one on page 27. Your attitudes and actions are to be the result of your commitment and obedience to Christ, who should be at the center of your marriage. This man is telling us that Christ should be at the center of our marriage. Sounds pretty good so far, doesn't it? How could you say that when I've just preached my liver out and told you that Christ is not the center, he's the head? He's the head of a marriage. If you think about it, if I'm on one side and a person's on the other side and Christ is in the middle, that puts us all on the same what? Same plane. Something to think about, isn't it? Well, of course, if you're going to put Christ as the head, you're going to have to put the man as the head too, aren't you? Christ and man, according to Scripture. Now, here's, here's what I want to read. Quote, I'm boss in my house. My wife has to obey me. Scripture is on my side. Some men take Paul's teaching and deduce that. But notice in Ephesians 5, 22 and 33, through 33, Paul does not emphasize the husband's authority over his wife. I've just read to you Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. I've expounded on it, and he says, let me read it again. Some men take Paul's teachings and deduce that, quote, I'm boss in my house, and my wife has to obey me, scriptures on my side. But notice in Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, Paul does not emphasize the husband's authority over his wife. You think I could get some sermons just going through these books? This one says on page 28, The husband, as the husband, you do not demand obedience. Snip, snip, snip. You do not order your wife to respect your authority. (laughs) I cannot believe this. Yes, I can believe. Help my unbelief. (laughs) <laughs> I know they're there. <laughs> I hear them on the radio. I see them on television. I have their books in my hand. Baal priests are in our midst, and our people are falling for it. She needs to accept responsibility. Oh, the, he also says she needs to accept responsibility and make decisions as much as her husband does. Don't you know, Abraham, I'm not going to go with you because God gives me as much right to make decisions around here as you do. Does God allow such an attitude in the church? No. Does he allow us to make our desires and responsibilities, if they're contrary to his, to exist? No. Does, he, does Christ demand our respect and our obedience if we are to stay in the relationship with him? But this man says a husband's not allowed to demand the respect and the obedience. Well, I would like to cover more, and I think I will, in another message at my congregation. Let me, let me read another book. I won't just pick on Norman Wright, and I guess he's a, been guest at times on uh, Dr. Dotson, Back to the Family. This is what you've got out there. And if you're supporting these kind of people, all I can say is shame on you. Shame on you. And I don't say that because I'm asking for your money. I'm just telling you, shame on you. Because you're supporting an antichrist system, a bail system, and we'll never get our country back until we take care of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the audience can hear it, but it says, but he's licensed. <laughs> well, here's one. This is Good Marriages Take Time. This is by David and Carol Hawking. And the reason I take this one here is, uh, first of all, I noticed as I was scanning through it, they said, quote, without doubt, this is the first chapter, first page, without doubt, communication is the major problem in marriages today. Isn't that interesting? 
Uh, I tell you what we ought to do. We ought to, we ought to read all the Bible passages that talk about communication being the problem in marriages. When you find one, let me know, will you? Okay, on page 138 it says this. This caught my eye. It says, a wife needs a husband who? And then there's a whole list of things. Who is her lover, friend, and provider? Uh, open to her suggestions, respects her opinions, seeks her advice, and so forth and so forth. So I read down through all of these things just to see if there was anywhere in there where it says a wife needs a husband who will say no even if she doesn't like it. Do you think that's in there? Or did he say in here, a wife needs a husband who demands respect and obedience or a wife needs a husband to fear and revere. Does he say a man needs a, a wife needs a husband that will rule over her? No, it's nowhere there. Nowhere. Don't you find that rather remarkable? Well, then I got to thinking. I was thumbing through this thing. After I read about what a wife needs a husband to do, I thought... It would be interesting to read what these two people have to say that a husband needs a wife. You know, the heading, a husband needs a wife who? And guess what the Bible, Bible, guess what this book says about what a husband needs a wife to do? Nothing. It's not in the book. Now, if, it's, if I've missed it somewhere, I'll correct it in the coming message, but I've thumbed through there pretty good. You see, I've we've got pretty big headings here. A wife needs a husband who? So I was thumbing through there. Well, let's find out what they have to say, that what a husband needs a wife to do. It's not in there. And why should we expect it to be in there? We're talking about the system on the left. It's effeminate. And what about the system on the right? Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And the verse I want us to notice is verse 8 and 9. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man. And in this book, the system on the left, they're telling us, what the man needs to do to make the woman happy and meet her needs. But in this book called the Bible, we see that the man was not created for the woman's needs or sake. The woman was created for who? The man's sake. If you don't like it, tear it out of your Bible. I'll find you a puke bucket somewhere and throw it in. I don't care. I didn't write it. But the point is, God didn't say, okay, I'm going to make a help meet for Eve. God made the help meet for Adam. And you got your two systems again. Is it coming into focus how it works? And this is how it works. When we do it God's way, both people are happy. When we don't do it God's way, neither one is happy. The women aren't happy today in the marriages, and the men are not happy today. Why do you suppose Norman Wright was able to write 40 books? That's one author. 40 of them. Because just as Jeremiah says, the false prophets feed off the sins or the iniquity of the people. We have the suffering going on, and then they keep throwing out answers, and we don't go back to God's word. The truth of the matter is, the wives that feel unfulfilled by their husbands, he's not providing my needs and so forth, will find if they do it God's way, if they do it God's way, they'll have fulfillment and happiness beyond their wildest expectations. You talk about love, it will be there. 
We are told that from the scriptures. Now, either God is a liar or he's not. Who are you going to believe? And if the men who so much desire to have peace and tranquility in life to the point that they're willing to become eunuchs, if they would do it God's way, they would find a peace that passeth understanding that would finally come. And sometimes I hear women say, well, you know, I feel like I don't have a life of my own anymore. You know, I, I feel like, you know, uh, I, I've lost my identity and so forth. Well, I'll tell you something. I lost my life back there when I said I do. I found out I couldn't rodeo like I wanted to. I found out I couldn't go with the guys like I wanted to. I found out that that wife and that baby had to be fed, and I've been working ever since. I lay down my life for my family. And that's God's plan. And she lays down her life for the family. And if you want to find your life, you must do what? Lose it. That is God's way. Certainly you lose your identity. When I come to Christ, do I not say, no longer I live, but who lives in me? Christ Jesus. No longer my will be done, but thy And for a woman to say, well, if you love me, you do this or that. No, the Bible has defined love. If you love me, keep my commandments. And if I won't love my God with all my heart, mind, and soul, how could I love my wife and why would she want such a man? And if I love her, I've got to love God first. And if I'm going to love God first... I must obey him and be the head of my house. And if she's going to love me, she must love God. And to do that, she must obey him, right? And we've got these women. As I said, there was one here, a holy roller, praise the Lord, praise Jesus. But the Bible says, I don't desire sacrifice. All the pomp and the things we can come up with, it is better to obey and I hear women say, I don't know what he wants for me. I cook for him. I've done this for him. I bore his children. You know, I do this and I do that. You know, I sacrifice for him. What does he want? It is better to obey than sacrifice. It's just as we are unto the Lord, so it is the wife unto the man. God's plan of authority. It's not being taught today, not being taught at all. In the coming message, I'm going to show you that the Bible has showed us clearly how a wife is to be treated. Because it dawned on me, who would know better than God? And was he not married? Did he not have a wife? We shall look at those in this series, because I'm not done. But I think I'll conclude the, this message this way. If you turn over to 1 Kings chapter 18, you'll find that the Baal priest and the true prophet are a threat one to another. It's either going to be them or us. The battle rages even today. I just showed you what the word of God said. And then I showed you what a Baal priest had to say. And I didn't know exactly how to conclude this message, and then it hit me. How much better, or how could it be any better than 1 Samuel chapter 18, excuse me, 1 Kings chapter 18. We'll read with verse 36. Then it came about at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel today, let it be known that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. 
Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that thou art God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on the face and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And if you analyze the battle, what it was, was he was saying, Lord, he prayed, let them see who is telling the truth and who isn't. Who's the false one and who's the true one? And God answered that prayer. And then, once he did, look what happened in verse 40. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And you see, we are involved in a warfare right now. Presently, it's spiritual. And you see, either I kill these false notions and put these men out of business, bury them, or they do me. It's up to you to decide. I just showed you in this message that how the two systems function. You're going to have to put to death the false system. And you're going to have to embrace the truth. And you are, and all of us, one of these days are going to have to deal really severely with the false priests in our land called Baal priests. Amen? We'll conclude with that. It's been a good camp. Appreciate seeing all of you. And Ted and I are going to pack up and head out right now. So we're going to both say goodbye. When, before we do, why don't we just stand and we'll close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the good days that you've just given us. We thank you for the fellowship. We're grateful for the surrendered souls that we've seen on Sunday afternoon. We're thankful for the truths that have been proclaimed here. We know, God, that we've been blessed beyond all possible things we could ever expect by the chance of being here and being with brothers and sisters of like mind. Father, we pray for your kingdom, for the cleansing of it, for the reestablishment of order. We pray, Father, for the victory that we know is ours for the taking, if we have the faith to do it. Pray for all these people here, that you give them safety as they proceed home, that you would watch over them and give them traveling mercies. I pray for Colonel Farrell, that you would bless him in his last message, that your spirit would guide and direct him, that you'd bless his life for being a faithful soldier and being manly and willing to stand up against impossible odds at times. I thank you, Father, for those that were responsible for putting this together, making it work. Pray that you'd bless their lives for the efforts they've done. Father, we pray for the homes in our land. I ask for a special blessing on this message and this series, that it would not harden hearts, but it would soften them and bring things back in order so that Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, would be glorified. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Goodbye, everybody.